Preface of Atlantic Classics, Series 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Dedication to Atlantic readers everywhere, from Alaska to Zanzibar, and from 9 to 90. Preface. When, some two years ago, a collection of Atlantic essays was offered to the public, it was the editor's idea that this volume should be, to use the current phrase, a kind of permanent exhibit of the character and quality of the Atlantic. In these hurrying days, even the sedatest of magazines must quicken its pace to keep abreast of the marching world, and much that is most serviceable in the Atlantic, during its appointed life, dies at the heart when a new number brings fresh interest to men's minds but a residue there is no more useful at the time perhaps than much which perishes but which evidently ought to have such length of days as the covers of a book can ensure for it the experiment was made with the first volume of atlantic classics composed of sixteen essays by as many authors all dealing with topics of more than temporary interest the success of this book which has been many times reprinted outstripped anticipation more than that it assumed a character quite unlooked for and proceeded on its own account to introduce itself into the curricula of colleges and high schools throughout the country welcomed as the editor is creditably informed by students as well as by teachers even a layman can see that in such a use there is a sound development a book of contemporary expression exhilarating to the student and knitting his interest to those of the world outside the schoolroom may be peculiarly suited to call forth his appreciation and to kindle emulation within him such a book may teach him to think of literature as a living thing quite as alive and full of spirit as he is himself and by such method perhaps tender shoots of young intelligence may be spared the blighting influence of too formal education these matters belong most properly to the province of the schoolmaster the editor's is a different purpose it is not a text which he seeks to compile but forgive a layman's distinction a book a book to read enjoy and keep to all who have found amusement and profit in the first series of atlantic classics i think i can promise that here shall be found no lowering of the bars but only the enlargement of interest which must come from such an influx of new company during pleasant hours spent in selecting this second series of essays typical of the atlantic i have more than once turned aside to re-read well-remembered pages of a similar character written a hundred years and more ago by men whose names if not effulgent still shine in clusters from the more condensed paragraphs of our literary histories comparisons are odious and stir inordinate prejudice so names shall not be mentioned here but as i turn from those enshrined volumes to the less sententious essays of our days i can truly say i feel no drop to earth from heaven here before me is a group of essays quite as individual if less self-conscious quite as urbane often in better taste and quite one reader thinks as suggestive of company he should like to keep Take, for instance, such a paper as Miss Mackenzie's Exile and Postman. Bind it in Levant, gild well ornament and title, and let it stand straight on your bookshelf for a hundred years. Then shall your great-grandson take it down, and learn with respect that in his grandsire's day English still lived as English, and that the magic of words cannot die. In republishing this collection, the Atlantic Press owes its warm thanks to every author represented, and desires to make acknowledgment to Hota Mifflin Company for the inclusion of Mr. Merwin's inimitable Dogs and Men, already reprinted in a volume of the author's own, to the Macmillan Company for permission granted to Miss Adams to allow her contemporary legend, The Devil Baby, to be reprinted here. It should be added that Mr. Chapman's shining paper on The Greek Genius will be found in more extended form in his volume of a similar title, to which every instructed reader should turn. E. S. The Atlantic Office, January 1918. End of preface. Chapter 1 of Atlantic Classics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Dogs and Men by Henry C. Merwin. There are men and women in the world who, of their own free will, live a dogless life, not knowing what they miss. And for them, this essay, securely placed in the dignified Atlantic, there to remain so long as libraries and books shall endure, is chiefly written. Let them not pass it by in scorn, but rather stop to consider what can be said of the animal as a fellow being entitled to their sympathy, and having, perhaps, a like destiny with themselves. As to those few persons who are not only dogless, but dog-haters, they should excite pity rather than resentment. The man who hates a good dog is abnormal, and cannot help it. I once knew such a man, a money-lender long since passed away, whose life was largely a crusade against dogs, carried on through newspapers, pamphlets, and in conversation. He used to declare that he had often been bitten by these animals, and that, on one occasion, a terrier actually jumped on the street-car in which he was riding, took a small piece out of his leg, a mere soupçon, no doubt, and then jumped off, all without apparent provocation, and in a moment of time. Probably this story, strange as it may sound, was substantially true. The perception of the dog are wonderfully acute. A recent occurrence may serve as the converse of the moneylender's story. A lost collie, lame and nearly starved, was taken in, fed, and cared for by a household of charitable persons, who, however, did not like or understand dogs, and were anxious to get rid of this one, provided that a good home could be found for him. In the course of a week there came to call upon them in her buggy an old lady who was extremely fond of dogs, and who possessed that combination of a masterful spirit with deep affection, which acts like witchcraft upon the lower animals. The collie was brought out, and the story of his arrival was related at length. Meanwhile the old lady and the dog looked at each other steadfastly in the eye. "'Do you want to come home with me, doggy?' she said at last, not really meaning to take him. Up jumped the dog and sat down beside her, and could not be dislodged by any entreaties or commands, and all parties were loath to use force. So she took him home, but brought him back the next day, intending to leave him behind her. Again, however, the dog refused to be parted from his new and real friend. He bestowed a perfunctory wag of the tail upon his benefactors. He was not ungrateful, but like all dogs, he sought not chiefly meat and bones and a comfy place by the fire, but affection and caresses. The dog does not live that would refuse to forsake his dinner for the companionship of his master. The mission of the dog, I say it with all reverence, is the same as the mission of Christianity, namely, to teach mankind that the universe is ruled by love. Ownership of a dog tends to soften the hard hearts of men. There are two great mysteries about the lower animals. One, the suffering which they have to endure at the hands of men the other the wealth of affection which they possess, and which for the most part is unexpended. All animals have this capacity for loving other creatures, man included. Crows, for example, show it to a remarkable degree. As much latent affection goes to waste in every flock of crows that flies overhead, as would fit a human household for heaven. A crow and a dog, if kept together, will become almost as fond of each other as of their master. Surely this fact— this capacity of the lower animals to love not only man but one another is the most significant the most deserving to be pondered the most important in respect to their place in the universe of all the facts that can be learned about them compared with it how trivial is anything that the zoologist or biologist or the physiologist can tell us about the nature of the lower animals the most beautiful sight in the world i once heard it said by myself to be honest is the expression in the eyes of an intelligent, sweet-tempered pup, a pup old enough to take an interest in things about him, and yet so young as to imagine that everybody will be good to him, so young as not to fear that any man or boy will kick him, or that any dog will take away his bone. In the eyes of such a pup there is a look of confiding innocence, a consciousness of his own weakness and inexperience, a desire to love and to be loved, which are irresistible." In older dogs one is more apt to notice an eager, anxious, inquiring look, as if they were striving to understand things which the Almighty had placed beyond their mental grasp. And the nearest approach to a really human expression is seen in dogs suffering from illness. Heine, who, as the reader well knows, served a long apprenticeship to pain, somewhere says that pain refines even the lower animals. 
and all who are familiar with dogs in health and in disease will see the truth of this statement i have seen in the face of an intelligent dog suffering acutely from distemper a look so human as to be almost terrifying as if i had accidentally caught a glimpse of some deep-lying trait in the animal which nature had intended to conceal from mortal gaze the dog in fact makes a continual appeal to the sympathies of his human friends and thus tends to prevent them from becoming hard or narrow there are certain families especially perhaps in new england and most of all no doubt in boston who need to be regenerated and might be regenerated by keeping a dog provided that they went about it in the proper spirit a distinguished preacher and author himself a unitarian remarked recently in an address to unitarians that they were usually the most self-satisfied people that he had ever met it was a casual remark and perhaps neither he nor those who heard it appreciated its full significance however the preacher was probably thinking not so much of unitarians as of a certain kind of person often found in this neighborhood and not necessarily professing any particular form of religion we all know the type when a man invariably has money in the bank and is respectable and respected was graduated at harvard has a decorous wife and children has never been carried away by any passion or enthusiasm knows the right people and conforms strictly to the customs of good society and when this sort of thing has been going on for perhaps two or three generations then there is apt to creep into the blood a coldness that would chill the heart of a bronze statue such persons are really degenerates of their peculiar kind and need to be saved perhaps by desperate measures let them elope with the cook let them get religion of a violent methodistic or of an intense ritualistic kind the two forms have much in common or if they cannot get religion let them get a dog give him the run of the house love him and spoil him and so by the blessing of providence their salvation may be effected reformers and philanthropists should always keep dogs in order that the spontaneous element may not wholly die out of them their tendency is to regard the human race as a problem and particular persons as cases to be dealt with not according to one's impulses but according to certain rules approved by good authority and supposed to be consistent with sound economic principles to my old friend blank who once liked me for myself without asking why i have long ceased to be an individual and am now simply an item of humanity to whom he owes such duty as my particular wants or vices would seem to indicate but if he had a dog he could not regard him in that impersonal way or worry about the dog's morals he would simply take pleasure in his society and love him for who he was without considering what he might have been i know and honor one philanthropist who in the middle life or thereabouts became for the first time the possessor of a dog and thenceforth there was disclosed in him a genuine vein of sentiment and affection which many years of doing good and virtuous living had failed to eradicate often i have heard of his civic deeds and his well-directed charities but my mind never quite warmed toward him until i learned that with spectacles on nose and comb in hand he had spent three laborious hours in painfully going over his spaniel and eliminating those parasitic guests which sometimes infest the coat of the cleanest and most aristocratic dog i am not ashamed to say that i have confidence in his wisdom now which i did not have before knowing that his head will never be allowed to tyrannize over his heart his name should be recorded here were it not that his modesty might be offended by the act three letters would suffice to print it in speaking of the dog as a kind of missionary in a household i mean it need hardly be said something more than merely ownership of the animal it will not suffice to pay a large sum for a dog of fashionable breed equip him with a costly collar and then relegate him to the stable or to the kitchen he should be one of the family living on equal terms with the others and their constant companion the dog's life is short at best and every moment of it will be needed for his development it is wonderful how year by year the household pet grows in intelligence how many words he learns the meaning of how quick he becomes in interpreting the look the tone of voice the mood of the person whom he loves he is old at ten or eleven and seldom lives beyond thirteen or fourteen if he lived to be fifty he would know so much that we would be uneasy perhaps terrified in his presence a certain amount of discipline is necessary for a dog if left to his own devices he is apt to become somewhat dissipated to spend his evenings out to scatter among the many the affection which should be reserved for a few 
but on the other hand a dog may easily receive too much discipline he becomes like the child of a despotic father a dog perfectly trained from the martinet point of view one who never jumps up on you never lays an entreating paw on your arm never gets into a chair or enters a drawing-room such a dog is a sad sight to one who really knows and loves the animal it is against his nature to be so repressed over careful housewives and persons who are burdened with costly surroundings talk of injury to carpets and other furniture if the dog has a right of entry everywhere in the house but what is furniture for is it not for display is it a guarantee of the wealth of the owners or is it for use blessed are those whose furniture is so inexpensive or so shabby that children and dogs are not excluded from its sacred precincts perhaps the happiest household to which i ever had the honour of being admitted was one where it was sometimes a little difficult to find a comfortable vacant chair the dogs always took the armchairs. alas where are those hospitable chairs now where are the dogs that used to sit upon them and wink and yawn and give their paws in humorous embarrassment the drawing-room was made for dogs and not dogs for the drawing-room would be lady barnes thesis did she formulate it it was this same lady barnes rhoda boughton's who once said i have no belief in eliza the housemaid i leave in charge here when i last came home from london the dogs were so unnaturally good that i felt sure she bullied them i spoke very seriously to her and this time i am glad to say they are as disobedient as ever and have done even more mischief than when i am at home and she laughed with a delicate relish of her own folly of all the writers of fiction by the way is there any whose dogs quite equal those of rhoda broughton even the beloved author of rab and his friends even sir walter himself with his immortal dandy dinmonts has not it seems to me given us such lifelike and homelike pictures of dogs as those which occur in her novels they seem to be there not of set purpose but as if dogs were such an essential part of her own existence that they crept into her books almost without her knowing it no room in her novels is complete without a dog or two and every remark that she makes about them has the quality of a caress even in a tragic moment the heroine cannot help observing that mink is lying on his small hairy side in a sun patch with his little paws crossed like the hands of a dying saint mr brown that dear faithful mongrel is for ever associated with the unfortunate joan and brenda's wolf would go resounding down the halls of time so long as novels are read perhaps the final test of anybody's love of dogs is willingness to permit them to make a camping ground of the bed there is no other place in the world that suits the dog quite so well on the bed he is safe from being stepped upon he is out of the way of draughts he has a commanding position from which to survey what goes on in the world and above all the surface is soft and yielding to his outstretched limbs no mere man can ever be so comfortable as a dog looks some persons object to having a dog on the bed at night and it must be admitted that he lies a little heavily upon one's limbs but why be so base as to prefer comfort to companionship to wake up in the dark night and put your hand on that soft warm body to feel the beating of that faithful heart is not this better than undisturbed sloth the best night's rest i ever had was once when a cocker spaniel puppy who had just recovered from a stomach ache dosed one to two soda mints and was a little frightened by the strange experience curled up on my shoulder like a fur tippet gently pushed his cold soft nose into my neck and there slept sweetly and soundly until morning companionship with his master is the dog's remedy for every ill and only an extreme case will justify sending him away or boarding him out to put a dog in a hospital unless there is some surgical or other necessity for doing so is an act of doubtful kindness many and many a dog has died from homesickness if he is ill keep him warm and quiet give him such simple remedies as you would give to a child pour beef tea or malted milk down his throat or even a little whiskey if he is weak from want of food and let him live or die as our fathers and our fathers dogs at home many dogs are sensitive to an excessive degree so sensitive indeed that any correction of them beyond such as can be conveyed by a word amounts to positive cruelty a dog of that kind may easily be thrown by harsh treatment into a state of nervous disorder and will be really unable to do what is required of him in that state he often presents an appearance of obstinacy whereas in fact he is suffering from a sort of nervous atrophy or paralysis 
closely resembling that of a bulky horse this nervous temperament makes the dog susceptible to misery in many forms but the worst evil that can befall it is to be lost the very words lost dog call up such pictures of canine misery as can never be forgotten by those who have witnessed them i have seen a lost dog lame emaciated wounded footsore hungry and thirsty yet suffering so intensely from fear and loneliness and despair from the mere sense of being lost as to be absolutely unconscious of his bodily condition the mental agony was so much greater that it swallowed up the physical pain a little boston terrier who was lost in a large city for two or three days became so wrecked in his nervous system that no amount of care or petting could restore him to equanimity and it was found necessary to kill him oh reader pass not by the lost dog succor him if you can preserve him from what is worse than death it is easy to recognize him by the look of nervous terror in his eye by his drooping tail and his uncertain movements there is a remorseful experience of my own of which i should be glad to unburden myself to the reader it once became my duty to kill a dog afflicted with some incurable disease instead of doing it myself as i should have done i took him to a place where lost dogs are received and where those for whom no home can be found are mercifully destroyed there instead of myself leading him to the death chamber as again i should have done i handed him over to the executioner the dog was an abnormally nervous and timid one and as he was dragged most unwillingly away he turned around as nearly as he could and cast back at me a look of horror of fear of agonized appeal a look that has haunted me for years whether he had any inkling of what was in store for him i do not know but it is highly probable that he had dogs and other animals are wonderful mind readers i have known three cases in which some discussion about the necessity of killing an old dog held in his presence was quickly followed by the sudden unaccountable disappearance of the animal and no tidings of him could ever be obtained although the greatest pains were taken to obtain them horses are inferior only to dogs in this capacity often especially in the case of vicious or half-broken horses an intention will flash from the mind of the horse to the mind of the rider or driver and vice versa without the slightest indication being given by horse or man men who ride race horses have told me that a sudden conviction in their own minds in the course of the race that they could not win has passed immediately to the horse and caused him to slacken his speed although they have not ceased to urge him it is notorious in the trotting world that faint-hearted and pessimistic drivers often lose races which they ought to win as to remarkable stories about this or that animal perhaps it might be said that they are probably true when they illustrate the animal's perceptive abilities and are probably false when they depend upon his power to originate there appeared lately an account of a race between loons in the wild state how the loons got together and arranged the preliminaries whether they made books on the event or adopted the pool system of betting was not stated how the race was run or rather flown amidst intense loon excitement and how the victor was greeted with screams of applause some power of origination animals and dogs especially have there is the familiar trick which dogs play when one to get a bone away from another rushes off a little space gives the bark which signifies the presence of an intruder then comes back and quietly runs away with the bone which the other dog in his curiosity to see who is coming has impulsively dropped this is an example not of reasoning only but of origination in general however when dogs surprise us as they frequently do it is by the delicacy and acuteness of their perceptive powers how unerringly do they distinguish between differing classes of persons as for example between the members of the family and the servants and again between the servants and the friends of the household unquestionably the dog has three sets of manners for these three classes of persons he will take liberties in the kitchen that he would never dream of taking in the dining-room we have known our cook to fly in terror from the kitchen because figaro a masterful cocker spaniel threatened to bite her if she did not give him a piece of meat forthwith figaro reasoned that the cook was partly his cook and that he had the right to bully her if he could as for the different members of the family the dog will size them up with an unerring instinct it is impossible to conceal any weakness of character from him and if you are not strong he will know that too as i write these lines the vision of mr guppy rises before me mr guppy was a very small boston terrier with a white head but otherwise of a brindle colour he had a beautiful mug much like that of a bulldog with a short nose wide jaws and plenty of loose skin hanging about his stout little neck 
it must be admitted that he was somewhat self-indulgent being continually on the watch for a chance to lie close by the fire a situation considered by his friends to be unwholesome for him mr guppy understood me very well he knew that i was a poor weak easy-going absent-minded creature with whom he could take liberties accordingly when we were alone together the rogue would lie sleeping with his head on the hearth while i was absorbed in my book but hark there is a step on the stairs of one whom mr guppy both loved and feared more than any dog ever loved or feared me and forthwith the little impostor would rise and crawl softly back to his place on a rug in the corner and there he would be found lying and winking with an expression of perfect innocence when the disciplinarian entered the room dogs have the same sensitiveness that we associate with well-bred men and women their politeness is remarkable offer a dog water when he is not thirsty and he will almost always take a lap or two just out of civility and to show his gratitude i know a group of dogs that never forget to come and tell their mistress when they have had their dinner feeling sure that she will sympathize with them and if they have failed to get it they will notify her immediately of the omission if you happen to step on a dog's tail or paw how eagerly after one irrepressible yelp of pain he will tell you by his caresses that he knows you did not mean to hurt him and forgives you in their relations with one another also dogs have a keen sense of etiquette a well-known traveller makes this unexpected remark about a tribe of naked black men living on one of the south sea islands in their everyday intercourse there is much that is stiff formal and precise almost the same remark might be made about dogs unless they are on very intimate terms they take great pains never to brush against or even touch one another for one dog to step over another is a dangerous breach of etiquette unless they are special friends it is no uncommon thing for two dogs to belong to the same person and live in the same house and yet never take the slightest notice of each other we have a spaniel so dignified that he will never permit another member of the dog family to pillow his head on him but with the egotism of a true aristocrat he does not hesitate to make use of the other dogs for that purpose often canine etiquette is so subtle that one has much difficulty in following it out in our household there are two uncongenial dogs who in ordinary circumstances completely ignore each other and between whom any familiarity would be resented fiercely and yet when we are out walking if i am obliged to scold or punish one of these two the other will run up to the offender bark at him and even jostle him as if he were saying well old man you got it that time aren't you ashamed of yourself and the other dog feeling that he was in the wrong i suppose submits meekly to the insult a family of six dogs used to pair off in couples each being on terms of special intimacy and affection besides these relationships there were many others among them for example they all deferred to the oldest dog although he was smaller and weaker than the rest if a fight began he would jump in between the contestants and stop it if a dog misbehaved he would rush at the offender with a warning growl and this exercise of authority was never resented the other dogs seemed to respect his weight of years his character which was of the highest and his moral courage which was undoubted the same dog his name was petro had many human traits he and his companion slept together on a sofa upstairs where of a cold night they would curl up together in an indistinguishable heap sometimes the old dog would put himself to bed before the others and then finding that he needed the warmth and companionship of their presence he would go into the hall push his head between the balusters and whine softly until they came upstairs to join him that animals reason is a fact of everyday experience that they can communicate their wants and feelings to one another and to man is equally plain when a cat or a dog wrote the late mr romans's pulls one's dress to lead one to the kittens or puppies in need of assistance the animal is behaving in the same manner as a deaf mute might behave when invoking assistance from a friend that is to say the animal is translating the logic of feeling into the logic of signs and so far as this particular action is concerned it is physiologically indistinguishable from that which is performed by the deaf mute mentally we are not so many epochs removed from the other animals and emotionally the connection is closer yet i will not discuss the question whether dumb animals have any sense of right and wrong i believe that they have this sense in a rudimentary degree or at least that it is latent in them and may be developed the popular instinctive notions about animals the results of the experience of the race seem to justify this view if we say a vicious horse remarked dr arnold why not a virtuous horse 
and do we speak of a kind horse moreover it is obvious that dogs have a sense of humor and they also have a sense of shame perfectly distinct from the fear of punishment of this sense of shame let me give one example the dog's eyesight so far at least as stationary objects are concerned is very poor his reliance being upon his sense of smell and i have often seen a dog mistake one of his own family for a strange animal run toward him with every sign of hostility and then when he came within a few feet of the other dog suddenly drop his tail between his legs and slink away as if he feared that somebody had noticed his absurd mistake can it be that an animal should possess a sense of humor and a sense of shame without having also some elementary sense of right and wrong but even if it be thought that he is devoid of that sense it is certain that he has those kindly impulses from which it has been developed all that is best in man springs from something which is practically the same in the dog that it is in him namely the instinct of pity or benevolence to that instinct as it exists in the lower animals darwin attributed the origin of conscience in man and there are now few if any philosophers who would give a different account of it i have seen a pup not six months old run to comfort another pup that has cried out in pain and the impulse that prompted this act was essentially the same as that which impels the noblest of mankind when they befriend the poor or the afflicted we are akin to the lower animals morally as well as physically and mentally but this is a modern discovery it is astonishing and confusing to realize how little organized christianity has done for the lower animals the ecclesiastical conception of them was simply that they were creatures without souls and therefore had no rights as against or at the hands of mankind to this day that conception remains although it is qualified of course by other and more humane considerations even cardinal newman said we have no duties toward the brute creation there is no relation of justice between them and us of course we are bound not to treat them ill for cruelty is an offence against the holy law which our maker has written on our hearts and it is displeasing to him but they can claim nothing at our hand into our hand they are absolutely delivered we may use them we may destroy them at our pleasure not our wanton pleasure but still for our own ends for our own benefit and satisfaction provided that we can give a rational account of what we do this position although not perhaps cruel in itself invariably results in immeasurable cruelties when an english traveller remonstrated with a spanish lady for throwing a sick kitten out of the second-story window she justified herself by saying that the kitten had no soul and that is the national point of view protestantism has been almost as indifferent as catholicism to the lower animals in fact the conscience which exists outside of the church catholic or protestant has in this matter outstripped the conscience of the church cruelty said dumar is the only unpardonable sin and the world is slowly but surely coming to that opinion the long deferred awakening of mankind to the sufferings of dumb animals was not due to a decline of the ecclesiastical conception of them although it has declined nor even to the new knowledge concerning the common origin of man and beast indeed it slightly preceded that knowledge but it was due to the gradual enlightenment and moral improvement of the race especially of the english-speaking race the nineteenth century as we are often told saw more discoveries and inventions than had been made in the preceding six thousand years but i believe that in future ages not one of these discoveries and inventions nor altogether will bulk so large as factors in the development and uplifting of man as will those humane laws and societies which first came into existence in that century we overvalue intellectual as compared with moral and emotional gifts the material civilization upon which we pride ourselves is almost wholly the achievement of the intellect fame and wealth luxury cultivation and leisure all the big prizes of the world in fact are obtained by the successful exercise of the intellect the moral qualities of themselves can procure us nothing but a clear conscience and the approval perhaps with mixed contempt of our neighbours and yet when the intellectual qualities are brought to the test of reality when one's view of them is not clouded by pride avarice or passion then how amazingly does their value shrink and shrivel when a man lies on his deathbed for example his intellectual achievements though of the highest order will seem as nothing to him he will ask himself simply whether he has lived a good or a bad life and after his death his family and his friends will look at the matter in precisely the same way even the progress of mankind is far more moral than intellectual 
competent authorities tell us that the anglo-saxon of today is mentally inferior to the greek who lived two thousand years ago and if the human race has improved during that time it is not so much because man has advanced in knowledge as because he has acquired more sympathy with his inferiors be they brute or human more generosity more mercy toward them not stevenson nor faraday nor morse nor fulton nor bell did so much for the human race to say nothing of the other animals as did that dueling irishman who in the year eighteen twenty two proposed in the english parliament amid shrieks and howls of derision what afterwards became the first law for the protection of dumb animals ever placed on the statute book of any country every movement for the relief of the brute creation has originated in england and when we damn as we righteously may john bull for one thing and another let us remember this fact to his eternal honour it is hard to part from an old dog friend with no hope of ever meeting him again hard to believe that the spirit of love which burns so steadfastly in him is quenched for ever but for those who hold what i have called the ecclesiastical conception of the lower animals no other view is possible that devout catholic and exquisite poet dr parsons has beautifully expressed this fact when parents die there is many a word to say kind words consoling one can always pray when children die tis natural to tell their mother certainly with them tis well but for a dog twas all the life he had since death is end of dogs good or bad this was his world he was contented here imagined nothing better not more dear than his young mistress sought no higher sphere having no sin asked not to be forgiven ne'er guessed at god nor ever dreamed of heaven now he has passed away so much of love goes from our life without one hope above but is there no hope is there not as much or if the reader prefers as little hope for the dogs as there is for man i remember reading years ago in a prominent magazine the statement that doubtless a few men of the very wickedest will become extinct at death whereas the rest of mankind will be immortal this view had some adherence then but would now be regarded by almost everybody as irrational who can believe that between the best and the worst man there is any such gulf as would justify so diverse a fate moreover we have learned that there are no chasms or jumps in nature one thing slides into another every creature is a link between two other creatures and man himself can be traced back physically mentally and morally to the lower animals is it not then reasonable to suppose that immortality belongs to all forms of life or to none that if man is immortal the dog is immortal too even to speculate upon this subject seems almost ridiculous our knowledge is so limited and yet it is hard to refrain from speculation the transmigration of souls may be a fact or men and dogs and all other forms of life may be simply forms temporary phases proceeding from one source and returning thereto but alas every supposition that we can make is rendered almost if not quite untenable by the mere fact that the human intellect has conceived it it is so unlikely that we should hit upon the right solution in this situation what we seem bound to do is to refrain from hasty and especially from egotistic conclusions to keep our minds open to regard the lower animals not only with pity but with a certain reverence we do not know what or whence they are but we do know that their nature resembles ours that they have individuality as we have it that they feel pain both physical and mental that they are capable of affection that although innocent as we believe their sufferings have been and are unspeakable is there no mystery here to many men to most men perhaps a dog is simply an animated machine developed or created for the convenience of the human race it may be so and yet it may be that the dog has his own rightful place in the universe irrespective and independent of man and that an injury done to him is an insult to the creator End of chapter 1chapter two of atlantic classics this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by phil shemp jungle night by william beebe part one within gun reach in front of me trudged my little akawai indian hunter he turned his head suddenly his ears catching some sound which mine had missed 
and i saw that his profile was rather like that of dante instantly the thought spread and the simile deepened were we two not alone and this unearthly hour and light then i chuckled softly but the silence that the chuckle shattered shrank away and made it a loud coarse sound so that i involuntarily drew in my breath but it was really amusing the thought of dante setting out on a hunt for kinkajous and giant armadillos jeremiah looked at me wonderingly and we went on in silence and for the next mile dante vanished from my thoughts and i mused upon the sturdy little red man jeremiah was his civilized name he would never tell me his real one it seemed so unsuited to him that i thought up one still less appropriate and called him Nupi, which is the three-toed sloth and in his quiet way he saw the humor of it for a more agile human being never lived Nupi's face was unclouded but his position as hunter to our expedition had brought decisions and responsibilities which he had not known before the simple life the unruffled existence in the little open banab with hammock cassava field and an occasional hunt this was of the past a wife had come slipping quietly into his life indian fashion and now before the baby arrived decisions had to be made Nupi longed for some store shoes and a suit of black clothes he had owned a big banab which he himself had built but a godmother like the cowbird in a warbler's nest had gradually but firmly ousted him and had filled it with diseased relatives so that it was unpleasant to visit he now to my knowledge owned a single shirt and a pair of short trousers the shoes were achieved i detected in him qualities which i knew that i should find in some one as i do on every expedition and i made him perform some unnecessary labor and gave him the shoes but the clothes would cost five dollars a month's wages and he had promised to get married white fashion in another month and that would consume several times five dollars i did not offer to help him decide his akawai marriage ceremony seemed not without honor and as for its sincerity i had seen the two together but my lips were sealed i could not tell him that a re-cementing of the ritual of his own tribe did not seem quite the equal of a five-dollar suit of clothes that was a matter for individual decision but to-night i think that we both had put all our worries and sorrows far away and i memory as well and i felt sympathy in the quiet pliant gait which carried him so swiftly over the sandy trail i knew Nupi now for what he was the one for whom i am always on the lookout the exceptional one the super servant worthy of friendship as an equal i had seen his uncle and cousins they were indians nothing more Nupi had slipped into the place left vacant for a time by aladdin and by satan and shimosaka and by drojak and trujillo all exceptional all faithful all servants first and then friends i say for a time for they all hoped and i think still hope with me that we shall meet and travel and camp together again whether in the singalese thorn bush or the himalayan dax in dyak canoes or among the camphor groves of sakarajama nupi and i had not been thrown together closely this proved a static expedition settled in one place with no dangers to speak of no real roughing it and we met only after each hunting trip but the magic of a full moon had lured me from my laboratory table and here we were we two plodding jungle words becoming better acquainted in silence than i have often achieved with much talk it was nearly midnight we traversed a broad trail of white sand between lines of saplings of pale barked rubber trees flooded saturated with milky gray light not a star appeared in the cloudless sky which in contrast to the great silver moon plaque was blue black these open sandy stretches so recently etched into what had been primitive jungle were too glowing with light for most of the nocturnal creatures who in darkness flew and ran and hunted about in them and the lovers of twilight were already come and gone the stage was vacant save for one actor the night hawk of the silvery collar whose eerie wheel or more leisurely and articulate who are you was queried from stump and log there was in it the same liquid tang 
the virile ringing of skates on ice which enriches the cry of the whippoorwill in our country lanes where the open trail skirted a hillside we came suddenly upon a great gathering of these goat-suckers engaged in some strange midnight revel usually they roost and hunt and call in solitude but here at least forty were collected on the white sand within an area of a few yards we stopped and watched they were dancing or rather popping as corn pops in a hopper one after another or a half dozen at a time they bounced up a foot or two from the ground and flopped back at the instant of leaving and returning uttering a sudden explosive whop this they kept up unceasingly for five minutes we gave to them and our passage interrupted them for only a moment later we passed single birds which popped and whopped in solitary state whether practicing or snobbishly refusing to perform in public only they could tell it was a scene not soon forgotten suddenly before us rose the jungle raw-edged with border zone of bleached ashamed trunks and lofty branches white as chalk of dead and dying trees for no jungle tree however hardy can withstand the blast of violent sun after the veiling of emerald foliage is torn away as the diver plunges beneath the waves so after one glance backward over the silvered landscape i passed at a single stride into what seemed by contrast inky blackness relieved by the trail ahead which showed as does a ray of light through closed eyelids as the chirruping rails climbed among the roots of the tall cattails out yonder so we now crept far beneath the level of the moonlit foliage the silvery landscape had been shifted one hundred two hundred feet above the earth we had become lords of creation in name alone threading our way humbly among the fungi and toadstools able only to look aloft and wonder what it was like and for a long time no voice answered to tell us whether any creature lived and moved in the treetops the tropical jungle by day is the most wonderful place in the world at night i am sure it is the most weirdly beautiful of all places outside the world for it is primarily unearthly unreal and at last i came to know why in the light of the full moon it was rejuvenated the simile of theatrical scenery was always present to the mind the illusion lying especially in the completeness of transformation from the jungle by daylight the theatrical effect was heightened by the sense of being in some vast building this was due to the complete absence of any breath of air not a leaf moved even the pendulous air roots reaching down their seventy-foot plummets for the touch of soil did not sway a hair's breadth the throb of the pulse set the rhythm for one's steps the silence for a time was as perfect as the breathlessness it was a wonderfully ventilated amphitheater the air was as free from any feeling of tropical heat as it lacked all crispness of the north it was exactly the temperature of one's skin heat and cold were for the moment as unthinkable as wind one's body seemed wholly negligible in soft padding moccasins and easy swinging gait close behind my indian hunter and in such khaki browns that my body was almost invisible to my own downward glance i was conscious only of the play of my senses of two at first sight and smell later of hearing the others did not exist we two were unattached impersonal moving without effort or exertion it was magic and i was glad that i had only my akawai for companion for it was magic that a word would have shattered yet there was this wonderfully satisfying thing about it that most magic lacks it exists at present to-day perhaps at least once a month and i know that i shall experience it again when i go to the window and look out upon the city night i find all extraneous light emaciated and shattered by the blare of gas and electricity but from one upreaching tower i can see reflected a sheen which is not generated in any powerhouse of earth then i know that within the twenty-four hours the terai jungles of garwal the tree ferns of pahang and the mighty moras which now surround us were standing in silvery silence and in the peace which only the wilderness knows i soon took the lead and slackened the pace to a slow walk every few minutes we stood motionless listening with mouth as well as ears 
for no one who has not listened in such silence can realize how important the mouth is like the gill of old which gave it origin our ear has still an entrance inward as well as outward and the sweep of breath and throb of blood are louder than we ever suspect when at an opera or concert i see some one sitting rapt listening with open mouth i do not think of it as ill-bred i know it for unconscious and sincere absorption based on an excellent physical reason it was early spring in the tropics insect life was still in the gourmand stage or that of pupil sleep the final period of pipe and fiddle had not yet arrived so that there was no hum from the underworld the flow of sap and the spread of petals were no less silent than the myriad creatures which i knew slumbered or hunted on every side it was as if i had slipped back one dimension in space and walked in a shadow world but these shadows were not all colourless although the light was strained almost barren by the moon mountains yet the glow from the distant lava and craters still kept something of colour and the green of the leaves great and small showed as a rich dark olive the afternoon's rain had left each one filmed with clear water and this struck back the light as polished silver there was no tempered illumination the trail ahead was either black or a solid sheet of light here and there in the jungle on each side where a tree had fallen or a flue of clear space led moonwards the effect was of cold electric light seen through trees in city parks when such a shaft struck down upon us it surpassed simile i have seen old paintings in belgian cathedrals of celestial light which now seems less imaginary at last the silence was broken and like the first breath of the trade wind which clouds the mazaruni's surface the mirror of silence was never quite clear again or so it seemed my northern mind stored with sounds of memory never instinctively accepted a new voice of the jungle for what it was each had to go through a reference clearing-house of sorts it was like the physiological reaction to words or phrases any strange wail or scream striking suddenly upon my ear instantly crystallized some vision of the past some circumstance or adventure fraught with similar sound then appreciably as a second thought came the keen concentration of every sense to identify this new sound to hear it again to fix it in mind with its character and its meaning perhaps at some distant place and time in utterly incongruous surroundings it may in turn flash into consciousness a memory simile stimulated by some sound of the future part two i stood in a patch of moonlight listening to the baying of a hound or so i thought that musical ululation which links man's companion wolf wards then i thought of the packs of wild hunting dogs the dreaded waracabra tigers and i turned to the indian at my elbow full of hopeful expectation with his quiet smile he whispered kunama and i knew that i had heard the giant tree frog of guiana a frog of size and voice well in keeping with these mighty jungles i knew these were powerful binas with the indians tokens of good hunting and every fortunate banab would have its dried mummy frog hung up with the tail of the giant armadillo and other charms well might these batrachians arouse profound emotions among the indians familiar as they are with the strange beings of the forest i could imagine the great goggle-eyed fellow sprawling high near the roof of the jungle clutching the leaves with his vacuum-cupped toes the moonlight would make him ghostly a pastel frog but in the day he flaunted splashes of azure and green on his scarlet body at a turn in the trail we squatted and waited for what the jungle might send of sight or sound and in whispers nupi told me of the big frog kunama and its ways it never came to the ground or even descended part way down the trees and by some unknown method of distillation it made little pools of its own in deep hollows and there lived and this water was thick like honey and white like milk and when stirred became reddish besides which it was very bitter if a man drank of it forever after he hopped each night and clasped all the trees which he encountered endlessly endeavouring to ascend them and always failing 
and yet if he could once manage to reach a pool of kunama water in an uncut tree and drink his manhood would return and his mind be healed when the indians desired this bina they marked a tree whence a frog called at night and in the daytime cut it down forming a big circle they searched and found the frog and forthwith smoked it and rubbed it on arrows and bow before they went out i listened gravely and found that it all fitted in with the magic of the night if an indian had appeared down the trail hopping endlessly and gripping the trunks gazing upward with staring eyes i should not have thought it more strange than the next thing that really happened we had settled on our toes in another squatting place a dark aisle with only scattered flecks of light the silence and breathlessness of the moon craters could have been no more complete than that which enveloped us my eye wandered from spot to spot when suddenly i began to think of that great owl-like goat-sucker the poor me one we had shot one at calicoon a month before and no others had called since and i had not thought of the species again quite without reason i began to think of the bird and its wonderful markings of the eyes which years ago in trinidad i had made to glow like iridescent globes in the light of a flash and then a poor me one called behind us not fifty feet away even this did not seem strange among these surroundings it was an interesting happening one which i have experienced many times in my life it may have been just another coincidence i am quite certain it was not in any event it was a dante-esque touch emphasized by the character of the call the wail of a lost soul being as good a simile as any other it started as a high trembling wail the final cry being lost in the depths of whispered woe nupi never moved only his lips formed the name by which he knew it kawalo whatever else characterized the sounds of the jungle at night none became monotonous or common five minutes later the great bird called to us from far far away as if from another round of purgatory an eerie lure to enter still deeper into the jungle depths we never heard it again nature seems to have apportioned the voices of many of her creatures with sensitive regard for their environment sombre voices seem fittingly to be associated with subdued light and joyous notes with the blaze of sunlit twigs in open meadows a bobolink's bubbling carol is unthinkable in a jungle and the strain of a wood peewee on a sunny hillside would be like an organ playing dance music this is even more pronounced in the tropics where quite aside from any mental association on my part the voices and calls of the jungle reflect the qualities of the twilight world the poor me one proves too much he is the very essence of night his wings edged with a velvet silence his plumage the mingled concentration of moss and lichens and dead wood i was about to rise and lead new peace still farther into the gloom when the jungle showed another mood a silent whimsy the humour of which i could not share with the little red man close to my face so near that it startled me for a moment over the curved length of a long narrow caladium leaf there came suddenly two brilliant lights steadily they moved onward coming up into view for all the world like two tiny headlights of a motor-car they passed and the broadside view of this great elater was still absurdly like the profile of a miniature tonneau with the top down i laughingly thought to myself how perfect the illusion would be if a red tail light should be shown when to my amazement a rosy red light flashed out behind and my bewildered eyes all but distinguished a number not but a tropical forest could present such contrasts in such rapid succession as the poor me one and this parody of a man's invention i captured the big beetle and slid him into a vial where in his disgust he clicked sharply against the glass the vial went into my pocket and we picked up our guns and crept on as we traversed a dark patch dull gleams like heat lightning flashed over the leaves and looking down i saw that my khaki was aglow from the illuminated insect within this betrayed every motion so i wrapped the vial in several sheets of paper 
and rolled it up in my handkerchief the glow was duller but almost as penetrating at one time or another i have had to make use of all my garments from toupee to moccasins in order to confine captives armed with stings beaks teeth or fangs but now i was at a complete loss i tried a gun barrel with a handkerchief stopper and found that i now carried an excellent long-handled flashlight besides i might have sudden use for the normal function of the gun i had nothing sufficiently opaque to quench those flaring headlights and i had to own myself beaten and release him he spread his wings and flew swiftly away his red light glowing derisively and even in the flood of pure moonlight he moved within an aura which carried far through the jungle i knew that killing him was of no use for a week after death from chloroform i have seen the entire interior of a large insect box brilliantly lighted by the glow of these wonderful candles still burning on the dead shoulders of the same kind of insect twice deeper in the jungle we squatted and listened and twice the silence remained unbroken and the air unmoved happening to look up through a lofty narrow canyon of dark foliage i was startled as by some sudden sound by seeing a pure white cloud moonlit low down pass rapidly across it was first astounding then unreal a bit of exceedingly poor work on the part of the property man who had mixed the hurricane scenery with that of the dog days even the elements seemed to have been laved with magic the zone of high wind with its swift flying clouds must have been flowing like a river just above the motionless foliage of the treetops this piece of ultra unnaturalism seemed to break part of the spell and the magic silence was lifted two frogs boomed again close at hand and now all the hound's similitude was gone and in its place another still more strange when we think of the goggle-eyed author far up in the trees the sound now was identical with the short cough or growl of a hungry lion and though i have heard the frogs many times since that night this resemblance never changed or weakened it seemed as if the volume the roaring outburst could come only from the throat of some large full-lunged mammal a sudden tearing rush from the trail side and ripping of vines and shrubs was mingled with deep hoarse snorts and we knew that we had disturbed one of the big red deer big only in comparison with the common tiny brown brockets a few yards farther the leaves rustled high overhead although no breath of wind had as yet touched the jungle i began a slow careful search with my flashlight and mingled with the splotches and specks of moonlight high overhead i seemed to see scores of little eyes peering down but at last my faint electric beam found its mark and evolved the first bit of real color which the jungle had shown always excepting the ruby tail light two tiny red globes gleamed down at us and as they gleamed moved without a sound apparently unattached slowly through the foliage then came a voice as wandering as impersonal as the eyes a sharp incisive wheat with a cat-like timber and from the eyes and voice i reconstructed a night monkey a kinkajou then another notch was slipped and the jungle for a time showed something of the exuberance of its life a paca leaped from its meal of nuts and bounced away with quick repeated pats a beetle with wings tuned to the base clef droned by some giant tree cricket tore the remaining intervals of silence to shreds with unmuted wing fiddles cricks so shrill and high that they well nigh passed beyond the upper register of my ear out into silence again the roar of another frog was comforting to my eardrum then silence descended again and hours passed in our search for sound or smell of the animal we wished chiefest to find the giant armadillo these rare beings have a distinct odor months of work in the open had sharpened my nostrils so that on such a tramp as this they were not much inferior to those of nupee this sense gave me a keen pleasure as eye or ear and furnished quite as much information the odors of the city and civilization seemed very far away gasoline paint smoke perfumery leather 
all these could hardly be recalled and how absurd seems society's unwritten taboo on discussion of this admirable but pitifully degenerate sense why may you look at your friend's books touch his collection of netsukes listen to his music yet dare sniff at naught but his blossoms in the open spaces of the earth and more than anywhere in this conservatory of unblown odors we come more and more to appreciate and envy a dog's sensitive muzzle here we sniffed as naturally as we turned ear and were able to recognize many of our nasal impressions and even to follow a particularly strong scent to its source few yards of trail but had their distinguishable scent whether violent acrid smell or delectable fragrance long after a crab jackal had passed we noted the stinging bitter taint in the air and now and then the pungent weight of some big jungle bug struck us like a tangible barrier the most tantalizing odors were the wonderfully delicate and penetrating ones from some great burst of blossoms odors heavy with sweetness which seeped down from vine or tree high overhead wholly invisible from below even in broad daylight these odors remained longest in memory perhaps because they were so completely the product of a single sense there were others too which were unforgettable because like the voice of the frog they stirred the memory a fraction before they excited curiosity such i found the powerful musk from the bed of leaves which a fawn had just left for some reason this brought vividly to mind the fearful compound of smells arising from the decks of chinese junks part three along the moonlit trail there came wavering whiffs of orchids ranging from attar of roses and carnations to the pungence of carrion the latter doubtless distilled from as delicate and as beautiful blossoms as the former there were besides the myriad and bewildering smells of sap crushed leaves and decaying wood acrid sweet spicy and suffocating some like musty books others recalling the paint on the noah's ark of one's nursery but the scent of the giant armadillo eluded us when we waded through some new strange odor i looked back at nupi hoping for some sign that it was the one we sought but that night the great armored creatures went their way and we ours and the two did not cross nupi showed me a track at the trail side made long ago as wide and deep as the spore of a dinosaur and i fingered it reverently as i would have touched the imprint of a recently alighted pterodactyl taking care not to spoil the outlines of the huge claw marks all my search for him had been in vain thus far though i had been so close upon his trail as to have seen fresh blood i had made up my mind not to give up but it seemed as if success must wait for another year we watched and called the ghostly kinkajous and held them fascinated with our stream of light we aroused unnameable creatures which squawked companionably at us and rustled the tree-top leaves we listened to the whispered rush of passing vampires skimming our faces and were soothed by the hypnotic droning hum which beetles left in their swift wake finally we turned and circled through side trails so narrow and so dark that we walked with outstretched arms feeling for the trunks and lianas choosing a sloth's gait and the hope of new adventures rather than the glare of my flash on our path when we entered calicoon trail we headed toward home within sight of the first turn a great black branch of a tree had recently fallen across the trail in a patch of moonlight before we reached it the branch had done something it should not have done it had straightened slightly we strained our eyes to the utmost but could not in this eerie light tell head from tail end of this great serpent it moved very slowly and with a motion which perfectly confounded our perception its progress seemed no faster than the hour hand of a watch but we knew that it moved yet so close to the white sand that the whole trail seemed to move with it the eye refused to admit any motion except in sudden shifts like widely separated films of a motion picture for minute after minute it seemed quiescent then we would blink and realized that it was two feet higher up the bank one thing we could see a great thickening near the centre of the snake it had fed recently and to repletion and slowly it was making its way to some hidden lair 
perhaps to lie motionless until another moon should silver the jungle was there any stranger life in the world whether it was a giant bushmaster or constrictor we could not tell in the diffused light i allowed it to go unharmed for the spell of silence and the jungle night were too strongly woven to be shattered again by the crash of gun or rifle Nupi had been quite willing to remain behind and now as so often with my savage friends he looked at me wonderingly he did not understand and i could not explain we were at one in the enjoyment of direct phenomena we could have passed months of intimate companionship in the wilds as i had done with his predecessors but at the touch of abstract things of letting a deadly creature live for any reason except for lack of a gun then they looked at me always with that puzzled look that straining to grasp the something which they knew must be there and at once always followed instant acceptance unquestioning without protest the transition was smooth direct complete the sahib had had opportunity to shoot he had not done so what did the sahib wish to do now to squat longer or to go on we waited for many minutes at the edge of a small glade and the event which seemed most significant to me was an actual spectacle one of the last of the night's happenings i sat with chin on knees coolie fashion a position which when once mastered and with muscles trained to withstand the unusual flexion for hour after hour is one of the most valuable assets of the wilderness lover and the watcher of wild things it enables one to spend long periods of time in the lowest of umbrella tents or to rest on wet ground or sharp stones where actual sitting down would be impossible thus is one insulated from bete rouge and enthusiastic ants whose sole motto is eternal preparedness thus too one slips as it were under the visual guard of human shy creatures whose eyes are on the lookout for their enemy at human height from such a position a single upward leap prepares one instantly for advance or retreat either of which manoeuvres is well within instant necessity at times then there were always the two positions to which one could change if occasion required flat-footed with armpits on knees or on the balls of the feet with elbows on knees thus is every muscle shifted and relaxed squatting is one of the many things which a white man may learn from watching his shikarees and guides and which in the wilderness he may adopt without losing caste we are a chair-ridden people and dare hardly even cross our knees in public yet how many of us delight in sitting buddha fashion or as near to it as we can attain when the ban of society is lifted a chairless people however does not necessarily mean a more simple primitive type the japanese method of sitting is infinitely more difficult and complex than ours the characters of our weak-thighed neolithic forebears are as yet too pronounced in our bodies for us to keep an upright position for long witness the admirable admittance of this anthropological fact by the architects of our subway cars who know that only a tithe of their patrons will be fortunate enough to find room on the cane-barked seats which have come to take the place of the stumps and fallen logs of a hundred thousand years ago so they have thoughtfully strung the upper reaches of the cars with imitation branches and swaying lianas to which the last comers cling jealously and swing with more or less of the grace of their distant forebears their fur to be sure is rubbed thinner nuts and fruits have given place to newspapers and novels and the roar and odours are not those of the wind among the leaves and blossoms but the simile is amusing enough to end abruptly and permit individual imagination to complete it when i see an overtired waiter or clerk swaying from foot to foot like a rocking elephant i sometimes place the blame farther back than immediate impatience for the striking of the closing hour it were more true to blame the gentleman whose habits were formed before caste whose activities preceded speech we may be certain that chairs will never go out of fashion we are at the end of bodily evolution in that direction but to see a white-draped lanky hindu or a red-cloaked lama of the hills quietly fold up no matter where he may be is to witness the perfection of chairless rest one can read or write or doze comfortably swaying slightly with a bird's unconscious balance 
or as in my case at present wholly disarm suspicion on the part of the wild creatures by sinking from the height of a man to that of a jungle deer and still i had lost nothing of the insulation which my moccasins provided from all the inconveniences of the forest floor looking at nupi after this rush of chaotic thoughts which came between jungle happenings i chuckled as i hugged my knees for i knew that nupi had noticed and silently considered my little accomplishment and that he approved and i knew that i had acquired merit in his sight thus may we revel in the approval of our super servants but they must never know it from this eulogy of squatting my mind returned to the white light of the glade i watched the motionless leaves about me many of them drooping and rich maroon by daylight for they were just unbudded reaching far into the dark mystery of the upper jungle stretched the air roots held so straight by gravity so unheeding of the whirling of the planet through space only one mighty liana a monkey ladder had revolted against this dominance of the earth's pull and writhed and looped upon itself in fantastic whorls while along its length rippled ever the undulations which mark this uneasy growth this crystallized st vitus plant a momentary shiver of leaves drew our eyes to the left and we began to destroy the optical images evolved by the moon shadows and to seek the small reality which we knew lived and breathed somewhere on that long branch then a sharp crack like a rifle lost whatever it was to us forever and we half leaped to our feet as something swept downward through the air and crashed length after length among the plants and fallen logs the branches overhead rocked to and fro and for many minutes like the aftermath of a volcanic eruption came a shower first of twigs and swirling leaves then of finer particles and lastly of motes which gleamed like silver dust as they sifted down to the trail when the air cleared i saw that the monkey ladder had vanished and i knew that its yards upon yards of length lay coiled and crushed among the ferns and sprouting palms of the jungle floor it seemed most fitting that the vegetable kingdom whose silence and majesty gave to the jungle night its magic qualities should have contributed this memorable climax long before the first spaniard sailed up the neighboring river the monkey ladder had thrown its spirals aloft and through all the centuries all the years it had seen no change wrought beneath it the animal trail was trod now and then by indian hunters and lately we had passed several times the sound of our gun was less than the crashing fall of an occasional forest tree now with not a leaf moved by the air with only the two of us squatting in the moonlight for audience the last cell had given way the sap could no longer fight the decay which had entered its heart and at the appointed moment the moment set by the culmination of a greater nexus of forces than our human mind could ever hope to grasp the last fibre parted and the mass of growth fell in the last few minutes as it hung suspended gracefully spiralled in the moonlight it had seemed as perfect as the new sprouted moras at my feet as i slowly walked out of the jungle i saw in this the explanation of the simile of artificial scenery of all the strange magic which had come to me as i entered the alchemy of the moonlight turned all the jungle to perfect growth growth at rest in the silvery light was no trace of gnawing worm of ravening ant or corroding fungus the jungle was rejuvenated and made a place more wonderful than any fairyland of which i have read or which i have conceived the jungle by day as i have said that too is wonderful we may have two friends quite unlike in character whom we love each for his own personality and yet it would be a hideous an unthinkable thing to see one transformed into the other so with the mist settling down and tarnishing the great plaque of silver i left the jungle glad that i could be far away before the first hint of dawn came to mar the magic thus in memory i can keep the dawn away until i return and some time in the future when the lure of the full moon comes and i answer i shall be certain of finding the same silence the same wonderful light and the waiting trees and the magic but nupi may not be there he will perhaps have slipped into memory with drojak and aladdin 
and if i find no one as silently friendly as nupi i shall have to watch alone through my jungle night end of jungle night Chapter Three of Atlantic Classics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Devil Baby at Hull House by Jane Addams. One. The knowledge of the existence of the Devil Baby burst upon the residents of Hull House one day when three Italian women, with an excited rush through the door, demanded that he be shown them. No amount of denial convinced them that he was not there, for they knew exactly what he was like, with his cloven hoofs, his pointed ears, and diminutive tail. Moreover, the devil baby had been able to speak as soon as he was born, and was most shockingly profane. The three women were but the forerunners of a veritable multitude. For six weeks the streams of visitors from every part of the city and suburbs to this mythical baby poured in all day long and so far into the night that the regular activities of the settlement were almost swamped. The Italian version, with a hundred variations, dealt with a pious Italian girl married to an atheist. Her husband vehemently tore a holy picture from the bedroom wall, saying that he would quite as soon have a devil in the house as that, whereupon the devil incarnated himself in her coming child. As soon as the devil baby was born, he ran about the table, shaking his finger in deep reproach at his father, who finally caught him and in fear and trembling brought him to Hull House. When the residents there, in spite of the baby's shocking appearance, wishing to save his soul, took him to church for baptism, they found that the shawl was empty, and the devil baby, fleeing from the holy water, ran lightly over the backs of the pews. The Jewish version, again with variations, was to the effect that the father of six daughters had said before the birth of a seventh child, that he would rather have a devil in the house than another girl, whereupon the devil baby promptly appeared. Save for a red automobile which occasionally figured in the story, and a stray cigar which, in some versions, the newborn child snatched from his father's lips, the tale might have been fashioned a thousand years ago. Although the visitors to the devil baby included people of every degree of prosperity and education, even physicians and trained nurses who assured us of their scientific interest, the story constantly demonstrated the power of an old wives' tale among thousands of people in modern society who are living in a corner of their own, their vision fixed, their intelligence held by some iron chain of silent habit. To such primitive people, the metaphor apparently is still the very stuff of life, or rather, no other form of statement reaches them, and the tremendous tonnage of current writing for them has no existence. It was in keeping with their simple habits that the reputed presence of the devil baby at Hull House did not reach the newspapers until the fifth week of his sojourn, after thousands of people had already been informed of his whereabouts by the old method of passing news from mouth to mouth. During the weeks of excitement, it was the old women who really seemed to have come into their own, and perhaps the most significant result of the incident was the reaction of the story upon them. It stirred their minds and memories as with a magic touch. It loosened their tongues and revealed the inner life and thoughts of those who are so often inarticulate. These old women enjoyed a moment of triumph, as if they had made good at last, and had come into a region of sanctions and punishments which they understood. Throughout six weeks, as I went about Hull House, I would hear a voice at the telephone repeating for the hundredth time that day, No, there is no such baby. No, we never had it here. No, he couldn't have seen it for fifty cents. We didn't send it anywhere because we never had it. I don't mean to say that your sister-in-law lied, but there must be some mistake. There is no use getting up an excursion from Milwaukee, for there isn't any devil baby at Hull House. We can't give reduced rates because we are not exhibiting anything and so on and on. As I came near the front door, I would catch snatches of arguments that were often acrimonious. Why do you let so many people believe it if it isn't here? We have taken three lines of cars to come, and we have as much right to see it as anybody else. This is a pretty big place. Of course you could hide it easy enough. What you say in that for? Are you going to raise the price of admission? We had doubtless struck a case of what the psychologists call the contagion of emotion, 
added to that aesthetic sociability which impels any one of us to drag the entire household to the window when a procession comes into the street or a rainbow appears in the sky. But the devil baby, of course, was worth many processions and rainbows, and I will confess that, as the empty show went on day after day, I quite revolted against such a vapid manifestation of an admirable human trait. There was always one exception, however. Whenever I heard the high, eager voices of old women, I was irresistibly interested, and left anything I might be doing in order to listen to them. 2. Perhaps my many talks with these aged visitors crystallized thoughts and impressions that I had been receiving through years, or the tale itself may have ignited a fire, as it were, whose light illumined some of my darkest memories of neglected and uncomfortable old age, of old peasant women who had ruthlessly probed into the ugly depths of human nature in themselves and others. Many of them who came to see the devil baby had been forced to face tragic human experiences, the powers of brutality and horror had had full scope in their lives, and for years they had had acquaintance with disaster and death. Such old women do not shirk life's misery by feeble idealism, for they are long past the stage of make-believe. They relate without flinching the most hideous experiences. My face has had this queer twist for now nearly sixty years. I was ten when it got that way, the night after I saw my father do my mother to death with his knife. Yes, I had fourteen children. Only two grew to be men, and both of them were killed in the same explosion. I was never sure they brought home the right bodies. But even the most hideous sorrows, which the old women related, had apparently subsided into the paler emotion of ineffectual regret. After memory had long done her work upon them, the old people seemed, in some unaccountable way, to lose all bitterness and resentment against life, or rather they were so completely without it that they must have lost it long since. Perhaps those women, because they had come to expect nothing more from life, and had perforce ceased from grasping and striving, had obtained, if not renunciation, at least that quiet endurance which allows the wounds of the spirit to heal. Through their stored-up habit of acquiescence, they vouchsafed a fleeting glimpse of that translucent wisdom so often embodied in old women, but so difficult to portray. I recall a conversation with one of them, a woman whose fine mind and indomitable spirit I had long admired. I had known her for years, and yet the recital of her sufferings, added to those which the devil baby had already induced other women to tell me, pierced me afresh. I had eleven children, some born in Bohemia and some born here, nine of them boys. All of the children died when they were little, but my dear Labucha, you know all about her. She died last winter in the insane asylum. She was only twelve years old when her father, in a fit of delirium tremens, killed himself after he had chased us around the room trying to kill us first. She saw it all. The blood splashed on the wall, stayed in her mind the worst. She shivered and shook all that night through, and the next morning she had lost her voice, couldn't speak out loud for terror. After a while her voice came back, although it was never very natural, and she went to school again. She seemed to do as well as ever, and was awful pleased when she got into high school. All the money we had I earned scrubbing in a public dispensary, although sometimes I got a little more by interpreting for the patients, for I know three languages, one as well as the other. But I was determined that, whatever happened to me, the Busha was to be educated. My husband's father was a doctor in the old country, and the Busha was always a clever child. I wouldn't have her live the kind of life I had with no use for my mind except to make me restless and bitter. I was pretty old and worn out for such hard work, but when I used to see Labucha on a Sunday morning, ready for church, in her white dress with her long yellow hair, braided round her beautiful pale face, lying there in bed as I was, being brought up a free thinker, and needing to rest my aching bones for the next week's work, I'd feel almost happy, in spite of everything. But of course no such peace could last in my life. The second year at high school, the butcher began to seem different and do strange things. You know the time she wandered away for three days and we were all wild with fright, although a kind woman had taken her in and no harm came to her. I could never be easy after that. She was always gentle, but she was awful sly about running away, and at last I had to send her to the asylum. She stayed there on and off for five years, but I saw her every week of my life, and she was always company for me 
what with sewing for her washing and ironing her clothes cooking little things to take out to her and saving a bit of money to buy fruit for her at any rate i had stopped feeling so bitter and got some comfort out of seeing the one thing that belonged to me on this side of the water when all of a sudden she died of heart failure and they never took the trouble to send for me until the next day she stopped as if wondering afresh that the fates could have been so casual but with a sudden illumination as if she had been awakened out of the burden and intensity of her restricted personal interests into a consciousness of those larger relations which are for the most part so strangely invisible it was as if the young mother of the grotesque devil baby that victim of wrongdoing on the part of others had revealed to this tragic woman much more clearly than soft words had ever done that the return of a deed of violence upon the head of the innocent is inevitable as if she had realized that although she was destined to walk all the days of her life with that piteous multitude who bear the undeserved wrongs of the world she would walk henceforth with a sense of companionship among the visitors were pitiful old women who although they had already reconciled themselves to much misery were still enduring more you might say it's a disgrace to have your son beat you up for the sake of a bit of money you've earned by scrubbing your own man is different but i haven't the heart to blame the boy for doing what he's seen all his life his father forever went wild when the drink was in him and struck me to the very day of his death the ugliness was born in the boy as the marks of the devil was born in the poor child upstairs this more primitive type embodies the eternal patience of those humble toiling women who through the generations have been held of little value save as their drudgery ministered to their men one of them related her habit of going through the pockets of her drunken son every payday and complained that she had never got so little as the night before only twenty-five cents out of fifteen dollars he had promised for the rent long overdue i had to get that as he lay in the alley before the door i couldn't pull him in and the copper who helped him home left as soon as he heard me coming and pretended he didn't see me i have no food in the house nor coffee to sober him up with i know perfectly well that you will ask me to eat something here but if i can't carry it home i won't take a bite nor a sup i have never told you so much before since one of the nurses said he could be arrested for my non-support i've been awfully close-mouthed it's the foolish way all the women in our street are talking about the devil baby that's loosened my tongue more shame to me there are those if possible more piteous still who have become absolutely helpless and can therefore no longer perform the household services exacted from them one last wish has been denied them i hoped to go before i became a burden but it was not to be and the long days of unwanted idleness are darkened by the haunting fear that they will come to think the burden too heavy and decide that the poorhouse is the best even then there is no word of blame for undutiful children or heedless grandchildren for apparently all that is petty and transitory falls away from austere old age the fires are burned out resentments hatreds and even cherished sorrows have become actually unintelligible it is as if the horrors through which these old people had passed had never existed for them and facing death as they are they seem anxious to speak only such words of groping wisdom as they can command this aspect of memory has never been more clearly stated than by gilbert murray in his life of euripides he tells us that the aged poet when he was officially declared to be one of the old men of athens said even yet the age-worn minstrel can turn memory into song and the memory of which he spoke was that of history and tradition rather than his own the aged poet turned into song even the hideous story of medea transmuting it into a beautiful remote song about far-off children who have been slain in legend children who are now at peace and whose ancient pain has become part mystery and part music memory that memory who is the mother of the muses having done her work upon them the vivid interest of so many old women in the story of the devil baby may have been an unconscious although powerful testimony that tragic experiences gradually become dressed in such trappings in order that their spent agony may prove of some use to a world which learns at the hardest and that the strivings and sufferings of men and women long since dead their emotions no longer connected with flesh and blood are thus transmuted into legendary wisdom the young are forced to heed the warning in such a tale 
although for the most part it is so easy for them to disregard the words of the aged. That the old women who came to visit the devil baby believed that the story would secure them a hearing at home was evident, and as they prepared themselves with every detail of it, their old faces shone with a timid satisfaction. Their features, worn and scarred by harsh living, even as effigies built into the floor of an old church become dim and defaced by rough-shod feet, grew poignant and solemn. In the midst of their double bewilderment, both that the younger generation were walking in such strange paths, and that no one would listen to them, for one moment there flickered up that last hope of a disappointed life, that it may at least serve as a warning while affording material for exciting narrations. Sometimes, in talking to one of them, who was but a hair's breadth this side of the darkness, one realized that old age has its own expression for the mystic renunciation of the world, the impatience with all non-essentials, the craving to be free from hampering bonds and soft conditions, was perhaps typified in our own generation by Tolstoy's last impetuous journey, the light of his genius for a moment making comprehensible to us that unintelligible impulse of the aged. Often, in the midst of a conversation, one of these touching old women would quietly express a longing for death, as if it were a natural fulfillment of an inmost desire. Her sincerity and anticipation were so genuine that I would feel abashed in her presence, ashamed to cling to this strange thing that shines in the sunlight and to be sick with love for it. Such impressions were in their essence transitory, but one result from the hypothetical visit of the devil baby to Hull House will, I think, remain a realization of the sifting and reconciling power inherent in memory itself. The old women, with much to aggravate and little to soften the habitual bodily discomforts of old age, exhibited an emotional serenity so vast and reassuring that I found myself perpetually speculating as to how soon the fleeting and petty emotions which seem so unduly important to us now might be thus transmuted, at what moment we might expect the inconsistencies and perplexities of life to be brought under this appeasing memory, with its ultimate power to increase the elements of beauty and significance, and to reduce, if not to eliminate, stupidity and resentment? 3. As our visitors to the devil baby came day by day, it was gradually evident that the simpler women were not moved wholly by curiosity, but that many of them prized the story as a valuable instrument in the business of living. The legend exhibited all the persistence of one of those tales which have doubtless been preserved through the centuries because of their taming effects upon recalcitrant husbands and fathers. Shamefaced men brought by their womenfolk to see the baby, but ill concealed their triumph when there proved to be no such visible sign of retribution for domestic derelictions. On the other hand, numbers of men came by themselves. One group from a neighboring factory, on their own time, offered to pay twenty-five cents, a half dollar, two dollars apiece, to see the child, insisting that it must be at Hull House because the women folks had seen it. To my query as to whether they supposed we would exhibit for money a poor little deformed baby if one had been born in the neighborhood, they replied, sure, why not? And it teaches a good lesson, too, they added as an afterthought, or perhaps as a concession to the strange moral standards of a place like Hull House. All the members of this group of hard-working men, in spite of a certain swagger toward one another, and a tendency to bully the derelict showman, wore that hangdog look betraying the sense of unfair treatment which a man is so apt to feel when his womankind makes an appeal to the supernatural. In their determination to see the child, the men recklessly divulged much more concerning their motives than they had meant to, and their talk confirmed my impression that such a story may still act as a restraining influence in that sphere of marital conduct, which, next to primitive religion itself, we are told, has always afforded the most fertile field for irrational taboos and savage punishments. What story more than this could be calculated to secure sympathy for the mother of too many daughters, and contumely for the irritated father? The touch of mysticism, the supernatural sphere in which it was placed, would render a man perfectly helpless. The story of the devil baby evolved today as it might have been centuries before in response to the imperative needs of anxious wives and mothers, recalled the theory that woman first fashioned the fairy story, that combination of wisdom and romance, in an effort to tame her mate, 
and to make him a better father to her children, until such stories finally became a rude creed for domestic conduct, softening the treatment that men accorded to women. These first pitiful efforts of women, so widespread and powerful that we have not yet escaped their influence, still cast vague shadows upon the vast spaces of life, shadows that are dim and distorted because of their distant origin. They remind us that for thousands of years women had nothing to oppose against unthinkable brutality save the charm of words, no other implement with which to subdue the fierceness of the world about them. During the weeks that the devil baby drew multitudes of visitors to Hull House, my mind was open to the fact that new knowledge derived from concrete experience is continually being made available for the guidance of human life, that humble women are still establishing rules of conduct as best they may, to counteract the base temptations of a man's world. Thousands of women, for instance, make it a standard of domestic virtue that a man must not touch his pay envelope, but bring it home unopened to his wife. High praise is contained in the phrase, we have been married twenty years and he never once opened his own envelope, or covert blame in the statement, of course he got to gambling, what can you expect from a man who always opens his own pay? The women are so fatalistically certain of this relation of punishment to domestic sin, of reward to domestic virtue, that when they talk about it, as they so constantly did in connection with the devil baby, it often sounds as if they were using the words of a widely known ritual. Even the young girl seized upon it as a palpable punishment to be held over the heads of reckless friends. That the tale was useful was evidenced by many letters similar to the anonymous epistle given here. Me and my friends, we work in tailor shop, and when we are going home on the Robbie Street car, where we get off that car at Blue Island Ave, we will meet some fellows sitting at that street where they drink some beer from pail. They keep looking cars all time, and they will wait and see if we will come. Sometimes we will have to work, and they will wait so long they are tired, and they don't care they get rest so long, but a girl that works in Twine Mill saw them talk with us. We know her good, and she say, what use talk with old drunk man for? We shall come to their dance when it will be. They will tell us, and we should know all about where to see them. That girl, she say, oh, if you will go with them, you will get devil's baby, like some other girls did who we knows. She say, Jane Adams, she will show one like that in Hull House, if you go down there. We shall come some time, and we shall see if that is truth. We do not believe her, for she is friendly with them old men herself. When she go out from her work, they will wink to her and say something else, too. We will go down and see you and make a lie from what she say. 4. The story evidently held some special comfort for hundreds of forlorn women, representatives of that vast horde of the denied and prescribed, who had long found themselves confronted by those mysterious and impersonal wrongs which are apparently nobody's fault, but seemed to be inherent in the very nature of things. Because the devil baby embodied an undeserved wrong to a poor mother, whose tender child had been claimed by the forces of evil, his merely reputed presence had power to attract to Hull House hundreds of women who had been humbled and disgraced by their children, mothers of the feeble-minded, of the vicious, of the criminal, of the prostitute. In their talk it was as if their long role of maternal apology and protective reticence had at last broken down, as if they could speak out freely because for once a man responsible for an ill-begotten child had been met up with and had received his deserts. Their sinister version of the story was that the father of the devil baby had married without confessing a hideous crime committed years before, thus basely deceiving both his innocent young bride and the good priest who performed the solemn ceremony, that the sin had become incarnate in his child, which to the horror of the young and trusting mother had been born with all the outward aspects of the devil himself. As if drawn by a magnet, week after week, a procession of forlorn women in search of the devil baby came to Hull House from every part of the city, issuing forth from the many homes in which dwelt the two unprofitable goddesses, poverty and impossibility. With an understanding that was quickened perhaps by my own acquaintance with the mysterious child, I listened to many tragic tales from the visiting women, of premature births, because he kicked me in the side, of children maimed and burned because I had no one to leave them with when I went to work. These women had seen the tender flesh of growing little bodies given over to death because he wouldn't let me send for the doctor. 
or because there was no money to pay for the medicine. But even these mothers, rendered childless through insensate brutality, were less pitiful than some of the others, who might well have cried aloud of their children, as did a distracted mother of her child centuries ago. That God should send this one thing more, of hunger and of dread, a door set wide to every wind of pain. Such was the mother of a feeble-minded boy, who said, I didn't have a devil baby myself, but I bore a poor innocent, who made me fight devils for twenty-three years. She told of her son's experiences, from the time the other little boys had put him up to stealing, that they might hide in safety, and leave him to be found with the goods on him, until grown into a huge man, he fell into the hands of professional burglars. He was evidently the dupe and stool-pigeon of the vicious and criminal, until the very day he was locked into the state penitentiary. If people played with him a little, he went right off and did anything they told him to. And now he's been sent up for life. We call such innocents God's fools in the old country, but over here the devil himself gets them. I fought off bad men and boys from the poor lamb with my very fists. Nobody ever came near the house except such like, and the police officers who were always arresting him. There were a goodly number of visitors, of the type of those to be found in every large city, who are on the verge of nervous collapse, or who exhibit many symptoms of mental aberration, and yet are sufficiently normal to be at large most of the time, and to support themselves by drudgery which requires little mental effort, although the exhaustion resulting from the work they are able to do is the one thing from which they should be most carefully protected. One such woman, evidently obtaining inscrutable comfort from the story of the devil baby, even after she had become convinced that we harbored no such creature, came many times to tell of her longing for her son, who had joined the army some eighteen months before, and was stationed in Alaska. She always began with the same words. When the spring comes and the snow melts, so I know he could get out, I can hardly stand it. You know, I was once in the insane asylum for three years at a stretch, and since then I haven't had much use of my mind except to worry with. Of course I know that it is dangerous for me, but what can I do? I think something like this. The snow is melting. Now he could get out, but his officers won't let him off, and if he runs away he'll be shot for a deserter. Either way, I'll never see him again. I'll die without seeing him. And then I begin all over again with the snow. After a pause, she said, the recruiting officer ought not to have taken him. He's my only son, and I'm a widow. It's against the rules. But he was so crazy to go that I guess he lied a little. At any rate, the government has him now, and I can't get him back. Without this worry about him, my mind would be all right. If he was here, he would be earning money and keeping me, and we would be happy all day long. Recalling the vagabondish lad, who had never earned much money, and had certainly never kept his hard-working mother, I ventured to suggest that, even if he were at home, he might not have worked these hard times, that he might get into trouble and be arrested. I did not need to remind her that he had already been arrested twice, that he was now fed and sheltered and under discipline, and I added, hopefully, something about seeing the world. She looked at me out of her withdrawn, harried eyes, as if I were speaking a foreign tongue. That wouldn't make any real difference to me, the work, the money, his behaving well and all that if I could cook and wash for him. I don't need all the money I earn scrubbing that factory. I only take bread and tea for supper, and I choke over that, thinking of him. 5. A sorrowful woman, clad in heavy black, who came one day, exhibited such a capacity for prolonged weeping that it was evidence in itself of the truth of at least half of her statement, that she had cried herself to sleep every night of her life for fourteen years, in fulfillment of a curse laid upon her by an angry man, that her pillow would be wet with tears as long as she lived. Her respectable husband had kept a shop in the red-light district because he found it profitable to sell to the men and women who lived there. She had kept house in the rooms over the store from the time she was a bride newly come from Russia, and her five daughters had been born there, but never a son to gladden her husband's heart. She took such a feverish interest in the devil baby, that when I was obliged to disillusion her, I found it hard to take away her comfort in the belief that the powers that be are on the side of the woman, when her husband resents too many daughters. But after all, the birth of daughters was but an incident in her tale of unmitigated woe, for the scoldings of a disappointed husband were as nothing to the curse of a strange enemy, although she doubtless had a confused impression 
that if there was retribution for one in the general scheme of things, there might be for the other. When the weeping woman finally put the events of her disordered life in some sort of sequence, it was clear that about fifteen years ago she had reported to the police a vicious house whose back door opened into her own yard. Her husband had forbidden her to do anything about it, and had said that it would only get them into trouble. But she had been made desperate one day when she saw her little girl, then twelve years old, come out of the door, gleefully showing her younger sister a present of money. Because the poor woman had tried for ten years, without success, to induce her husband to move from the vicinity of such houses, she was certain that she could save her child only by forcing out the bad people from her own dooryard. She therefore made her one frantic effort, found her way to the city hall, and there reported the house to the chief himself. Of course, the bad people stood in with the police, and nothing happened to them except, perhaps, a fresh levy of blackmail. But the keeper of the house, beside himself with rage, made the dire threat and laid the curse upon her. In less than a year, from that time, he had enticed her daughter into a disreputable house in another part of the district. The poor woman, ringing one doorbell after the other, had never been able to find her. But the girl's sisters, who in time came to know where she was, had been dazzled by her mode of life. The weeping mother was quite sure that two of her daughters, while still outwardly respectable and working downtown, earned money in the devious ways which they had learned all about when they were little children. Although for the past five years the now prosperous husband had allowed the family to live in a suburb where the two younger daughters were growing up respectable. At moments it seemed possible that these simple women, representing an earlier development, eagerly seized upon the story simply because it was primitive in form and substance. Certainly, one evening, a long-forgotten ballad made an unceasing effort to come to the surface of my mind as I talked to a feeble woman who, in the last stages of an incurable disease from which she soon afterwards died, had been helped off the streetcar in front of Hall House. The ballad tells that the lover of a proud and jealous mistress, who demanded as a final test of devotion that he bring her the heart of his mother, had quickly cut the heart from his mother's breast and impetuously returned to his lady, bearing it upon a salver, but that, when stumbling in his gallant haste, he stooped to replace upon the silver plate his mother's heart, which had rolled upon the ground, the heart, still beating with tender solicitude, whispered the hope that her child was not hurt. The ballad itself was scarcely more exaggerated than the story of our visitor that evening, who had made the desperate effort of a journey from home in order to see the devil baby. I was familiar with her vicissitudes, the shiftless drinking husband and the large family of children, all of whom had brought her sorrow and disgrace, and I knew that her heart's desire was to see again before she died her youngest son, who was a life prisoner in the penitentiary. She was confident that the last piteous stage of her disease would secure him a week's parole, founding this forlorn hope upon the fact that they sometimes let them out to attend a mother's funeral, and perhaps to let Joe come a few days ahead. He could pay his fare afterwards from the insurance money. It wouldn't take much to bury me. Again we went over the hideous story. Joe had violently quarreled with a woman, the proprietor of the house in which his disreputable wife lived, because she withheld from him a part of his wife's earnings, and in the altercation had killed her, a situation, one would say, which it would be difficult for even a mother to condone. But not at all. Her thin, gray face worked with emotion, her trembling hands restlessly pulled at her shabby skirt as the hands of the dying pluck at the sheets. But she put all the vitality she could muster into his defense. She told us he had legally married the girl who supported him, although Lily had been so long in that life that few men would have done it. Of course such a girl must have a protector, or everybody would fleece her. Poor Lily said to the day of her death that he was the kindest man she ever knew, and treated her the whitest that she herself was to blame for the murder because she told on the old miser. And Joe was so hot-headed she might have known that he would draw a gun for her. The gasping mother concluded, he was always that handsome and had such a way. One winter, when I was scrubbing in an office building, I'd never get home much before twelve o'clock. But Joe would open the door for me just as pleasant as if he hadn't been waked out of a sound sleep. She was so triumphantly unconscious of the incongruity of a sturdy son in bed while his mother earned his food, that her auditors said never a word, and in silence we saw a hero evolve before our eyes. 
a defender of the oppressed, the best beloved of his mother, who is losing his high spirits and eating his heart out behind prison bars. He could well defy the world even there, surrounded as he was by that invincible affection which assures both the fortunate and unfortunate alike that we are loved, not according to our deserts, but in response to some profounder law. This imposing revelation of maternal solicitude was an instance of what continually happened in connection with the devil baby. In the midst of the most tragic recitals, there remained that something in the souls of these mothers which has been called the great revelation of tragedy, or sometimes the great illusion of tragedy, that which has power in its own right to make life acceptable and at rare moments even beautiful. At least, during the weeks when the devil baby seemed to occupy every room in Hull House, one was conscious that all human vicissitudes are in the end melted down into reminiscence, and that a metaphorical statement of those profound experiences which are implicit in human nature itself, however crude in form the story may be, has a singular power of healing the distracted spirit. If it has always been the mission of literature to translate the particular act into something of the universal, to reduce the element of crude pain in the isolated experience, by bringing to the sufferer a realization that his is but the common lot, this mission may have been performed by such stories as this, for simple, hard-working women, who, after all, at any given moment, compose the bulk of the women in the world. End of section 3